Well, you have seen the headlines. They're pretty clear and very categorical as to the statement of the defense minister from the briefing, which you just watched. Nigeria is bleeding, is what they all had on the front page. And I know watching my colleague last night, Jim Kimbaloi, and some analysts saying Nigeria is bleeding. Uh, what should be done? Because if a patient is bleeding and nothing is done to stop the bleed, it could be fatal. But this morning, we have with us uh, retired Major General Henry Ayola, who is a former commander of the Special Task Force Operation Safe Haven. We're going to be asking him just how bad is this bleed. General, welcome to Sunrise Daily. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, viewers. Well, when you saw that, I don't know, when you heard the statement of the defense minister, did it come, I don't know, nothing new to you, was it? Uh, not really. I think it's just one way of uh, describing the state of uh, security in the nation right now. You do agree with him that Nigeria is bleeding? Oh, if there is a stronger word than bleeding, maybe it would be more appropriate. How bad is it? Um, well, I mean, at the point, I, I think I made this point on this platform before, that it's like the whole hell is let loose upon Nigeria. Uh, because the, the avalanche of security challenges, you know, taking place and happening to us concurrently, is very unusual. It's very, I mean, sometimes you have to pause and ask, I mean, could this be an expression of displeasure <laughs> from the divine? towards us, or could it be some self-inflicted problems on our part? Or could it be, having not paid the price initially, we are paying the price eventually? You know, things that ought to have been done in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, uh, which we didn't do up to now, you know? So, it's a, it's a, num it's a whole range of things involved. So, of course, if you say Nigeria is bleeding, yeah, that, that's one good way of, the, you know, describing it. Mm. Yeah. From, from, you know, the different, uh, how will I put it now, is, is it theories now <laughs> that you have put out there? I, I, I imagine that when you sit, I mean, as somebody who has served meritoriously in the Nigerian military uh, for years, you know, when you try to analyze all of these issues, you also seem to be at a loss. Uh, but what do you find is your best explanation uh, for all that is going on, the simultaneous attacks that we seem to be experiencing on almost every front? Each one seems to be peculiar, or do you see a common thread running through, through it all? Yeah, like, like I said, if you look at, if we try to make a list, for example, the Boko Haram situation is there. Then, of course, there are other security issues that were not even as conspicuous as banditry, kidnapping, raping, sacking farmers from their farms, and all of these. There are things like, like uh, I mean, drug addiction, drug misuse, uh, small, you know, gangsterism, things like that, you know, uh, simple ones that are happening at local levels. Okay, so uh, in crisis management, we, we are trained to find solutions. Uh, most of what we have seen is highlighting the problems. So what is the solution? We have prescribed so many things. Sometimes I'm beginning to sound like a broken record myself because I don't know who's listening, really. Uh, I mean, sometimes when I'm called to discuss this, I, I, I'm a little pensive as to what am I coming to say that I've not said before. You know, because, I mean, there are things that can be done at all levels. So it's like, who is to do them? Where do we, we there, there has to be a convergence of efforts where we can then distribute tasks accordingly and so everybody can be working. I've not seen that kind of move, you know. So most of what we do in the, most of the other is town hall meetings or conferences or dialogues, whatever we call it, we, we do a lot of highlighting of the problems. Some of the solutions that have been preferred from some, these past meetings 
we don't know whether anybody is working on them or not. Okay, of course, I'm, I'm, granted, I'm sure there are people who are working. Maybe the results are not yet visible. Uh -huh. But I think we, we, we have to keep talking, we have to keep advising, we have to keep suggesting, you know. So I think that's where we find ourselves. Mm. But we are not helpless, really. We are not helpless. There, there's still so much more that can be done. The question is, well, you have said the solutions have been proffered. Uh, but for the problem itself, would we say that we have been able to diagnose it properly? Uh, because, <laughs> as you pointed out, some, you know, some people might agree with you or might say, okay, maybe this is something we've left undone that has now grown into a monster and is biting us in the bum. Or maybe, uh, maybe some divine is actually uh, not unhappy with us and <laughs> maybe we need to cleanse the land because really how do you explain all that we have seen in the southwest of the country uh, which had enjoyed some relative peace there is some mumblings agitations already happening there as well in the southeast we've seen an onslaught on security operatives this you know is it's it's a different type of um it's a different type of um, challenge. Yes, a different type of security challenge. Yeah. In the northeast of the country, we've been at that one, the challenge of insurgency now, for over 12 years. And it doesn't seem like it's abating. There's anything. We're now facing a bigger risk as a result of the death of President uh, of Chad, Idris Debi. That is also another potential problem that could aggravate. Uh, you know, what is happening in the south, in the northeast of the country. In the northwest of the country, we've had to deal with banditry, with different types of solutions. It would seem that we've not even been able to agree on what needs to be done to, to, to stem the situation. But some people are saying, if we all agree that this is criminality, why is it so difficult for us to apply the solution that we think should be applied to criminals? Yeah, thank you very much. That, that, that's, uh, that's a food for thought for every one of us. Uh, in fact, my concerns uh, come from, uh, is it possible that we fought the civil war better than we are fighting the area of challenges we have right now? Because that's what it looks like. There were things that were done during the civil war to, you know, to solve that problem. Is it that we didn't learn any lessons from those? Because I don't even see us putting up half the effort of what was put up to fight the civil war. So, so you begin to ask yourself, so have we advanced as a people? If what we did well some 40 years or more ago, we cannot repeat, we cannot even do better now. You know, so that's the issue. And of course, until a problem is seen jointly, collectively, as a national problem, I think that is a major difference I've seen. At the beginning, some part of the country felt, oh, we don't have, the problem is not here, it's there. It's them, there. So it was not our problem until it began to spread. And now it's all over the nation. So I, I think by now it should be clear to all of us that it is our problem. It's our, a national problem. And so we should give it a national you know, attack, you know, putting all things, you know, bringing all means to bear. Mm. But why do you say it's a national, I mean, of course the problems are now nationally spread, but when you say uh, that, you know, some people saw it as, you know, the problem of some other people rather than their problem, yeah. um, and you say now the problem has spread, is it that one problem? Because I want to believe that the major problem which you referred to is the Boko Haram insurgency. Is that the problem which has now degenerated into what the rest of the country is experiencing? No, 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 not at all. Let, let me take you back. You made a point about defining the problem. You see, not just defining the problem. You, when you diagnose the problem, you define, you have to dimension the problem appropriately. Because even though you could be attacking a different problem and not the one you intend to attack. So all of that has not come to focus all along before. But I think now, I think it's, it should be clear enough now that... Instead of dismissing the problem or evading the problem, which is one of the approaches we've always used, or simply just treating it scantily or, or just you know, pushing it off you, but we need to decisively 
attack the problem now. But in doing that, we need to mobilize the entire nation. We, we, we need to create a sense of urgency for everybody and bring all the agencies, include, I have always advocated an all stakeholder approach to solving problems. Nigerian is, we are all, we are all stakeholders in the, in the enterprise called Nigeria, and we all, we all have a stake in it. At the, at the, in the final analysis, we all be losers if this nation goes down. Either the apparent villains or the seeming you know, victims, we all be losers. So it, it calls for, from an all of society approach you know, for us to attack this problem. And that means everybody bringing on board what he has. I've said that again and again. But I've not seen actions that is bringing. Of course, I've seen meetings, town hall meetings, seminars, and all of that. And most of the time, the people in those seminars and meetings are not the actors. They are not the ones who are supposed to act on the, you know, the proposals that are coming out from those meetings. So again, you ask yourself, I was listening to the Minister of Information yesterday about the town hall meeting they, they had in Kaduna. And he was making the point that he is planning to put it forward to the uh, Council of State and the Federal Executive Council and all that. Yeah, we, we need that. So that let it come to the table of those who need to act. So that it's not just individuals, communities, and uh, you know, as societies and organizations, your preferring solutions, and they are not the ones to act on those solutions. Mm. So I think that will help us. That will help us. Perhaps maybe we should even set up a, a committee or a national committee that will garner all the solutions that are coming out. Look, there's hardly anything in Nigeria that has not been researched into at one time or the other. If you go to some of our shelves, there are fantastic reports of researches that have been done over the years concerning different challenges. Mm. So, I mean, NIPS is there. They submit every year a paper to the presidency. They, they take a problem, a national problem, they do a whole lot of analysis, do study, and, and present a solution. So what are we doing with all that? What are we doing with the ones coming out of National Defense College, coming out from different institutions? So, so, so it's not lack of pro, uh, solutions that is our problem. Sometimes you, you, either we don't have sufficient will to tackle particular problems. Maybe for, for some other unknown, un, unstated reasons, you know, but the solutions are there. But General, you know, what you, even though, yes, you, you have said, you have said, you have put forward your own solutions many times and you also believe that the solutions already are there for those who seek answers. Um, I just for the benefit of our viewers and for those who might just be watching for the very first time. Um, give us a sense of your concerns as to what could happen um, now that the president of Chad is dead and he's been succeeded by his son. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to talk on that. Uh, let me start by offering my condolences to the family of the uh, late president of Chad, to the government and the people of Chad. To, to the people of West, West Africa and Africa as a whole, because uh, we must give it to President, late President Deby. Uh, he was such a stabilizing uh, force within our sub-region particularly, within the Sahel and West Africa in particular, and up to Central African Republic, of course, where he also had his uh, hand in some pie there. Um, mm, the, the implications are so far-reaching. You see, when you have a strong leader like that, more often than not, it's at the expense of strong institutions. So for me, the, the first lesson for us as a nation is to highlight the importance of building strong institutions, which, which is a major component of a system or a system of systems that nations ought to run. Nations that are strong are nations that have done that, that have built system of systems, strong institutions, structures, you know, processes, procedures, you know, checklists for doing things. I've said this again and again, okay? Not individual strong persons and strong leaders. Of course, we, like I said, we must give it to him. He obviously was a strong leader. But then, you know, if we look at the implication, let's start from Chad itself. Having had such a strong leader, his absence is going to create a major vacuum. Now, you've seen that the son, it's 37-year-old officer, is the one taking over from the father, he's 69-year-old late president. Now, I mean, no matter how smart this guy can be, there certainly will be some areas that he doesn't have the requisite experience to handle. 
okay? But that's not even the issue. Is that what their constitution says? I, I find out that there is no... They put it in abeyance. They don't have a vice president. They put the constitution in abeyance. No, no, no. The constitution itself is even contrived. How can you have a constitution that gives a president power to appoint a vice president? So if he refuses to appoint, then there is no vice president. And that's what has happened. You give a president, he has the power to appoint a vice president, so which he had not appointed. The Senate or the National Assembly had not been convened, had not been you know, inaugurated. So there is a serious vacuum. And that's why the, the military had to come in and put the sum forward. So you can see the institution not being strong, not being there on ground. And that has created that, that, that vacuum. So again, so that tells you that it's going to engender a lot. And don't forget, he died in a battle against the, this people called FAC, FCCC, the Front for, uh, for Change and Concord in Chad, who are mercenaries leaving Libya to come back home. And because they've gotten used to power, they have so much armament and all that. They want to come back home in power. That, that's, that's the problem. And the same way he fought last year, between March, April last year, when he fought Boko Haram, drove them out of their territory back into Nigeria. Of course, I mean, I would say he's a soldier of soldiers, you know, who, and I think the spirit of that soldier of soldiers had overtaken his, you know, you know, his uh, passion that he had to do it again, and this time it ended up this way. Uh, so, with these people coming back home, and then knowing that the president who was destabilizing power, who was able to checkmate a lot of the security issues the, issues the nation had been suffering, is now gone, they'll be emboldened to say, wow, this is a good chance for them. And that cuts across not just Chad. That takes us to, if we look at the Sahel, the whole of the Sahel, the G5, you know, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, uh, Niger, and the, uh, what the fifth one? Yeah, all of them. He, he also was one of the strongest, you know, in that group. The same way, if we look at West Africa, the multinational joint tax force, which we are championing, was moved to Njemina, you know, when this administration came in 2015. And that's because our president must have seen, uh, you know, President uh, Debbie as a very good ally. And I, I want to use this opportunity also to commiserate with our president. But you remember he visited, uh, he visited our president about three weeks ago. And that shows they, they have a good, uh, you know, rapport. Really? And, uh, and uh, of course, he would have been a very good ally, even in fighting Boko Haram, you know, putting his efforts through the multinational joint task force and then working with our own troops on ground in the Northeast. Okay, so it, it's a great loss for us. But beyond that, now when we realize that most of the challenges we have relating to uh, banditry, uh, rebels, coming from Libya, Mali, Chad, Niger, he was like a blocking force in reducing the infiltration of these uh, arms, small arms and light weapons, which we're already complaining about. Now with him out of the scene, <laughs> I, I, I fear that there may be an increase of such movements. Because you see, once a strong person leaves like that, people get emboldened to start doing all kinds of things they were not doing before. So we, we need to start thinking about that. We need to start thinking about his role in the multinational joint tax force. Nigeria has been championing him most of the time. He's been the closest to contributing, both contributing troops and resources to that force. Do you think that we have been positioned properly, though? Because uh, the first thing that came to my mind also is the fact that the current chief of defense staff um, you know, served in the multinational joint task force, and he even headed it at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, do you think that with his own experience and the relationship that you know he must have built uh, with the other countries we, who contributed to the multinational joint task force, we will be we do have some leverage of some sort uh, to be able to now that we have been forewarned by the president by the death of the president and we know uh, that you know this could have grave implications. We do have some leverage somewhere with his own experience. Yeah, we do. I mean, obviously at a, at a personal level, perhaps. Uh, but you, you know, uh, the contribution of each country to, to the multinational joint task force is also a function of how strong that country is. Mm. What, how do they do with their own internal crisis? In fact, what is likely to happen, and it's a great possibility, that even Chad himself will become more inwardly drawn with the challenge that now they are going that to be they facing. Have. They cannot be throwing their weights all around the regions like they were doing before. 
You know, so, so the tendency is that they're going to become inwardly drawn and focused and maybe withdraw some of their contributions from this other, you know, multinational giant, joint tax force, their contribution to the G5 in the Sahel and all of that. But it could also have implications for, I mean, if the country is not stable, that of, of course naturally has implications for us. The humanitarian, there could be an attendant humanitarian oh, of course, crisis. Of course. Um, is it something that we will be prepared for, considering just how in dire straits we are in that region as well? Yeah, just about a week ago, I was speaking on one platform, and I was referring to the, uh, we used to have presidential committee on small arms and light weapons, which has been, uh, you know, in the process of turning it to a commission, okay? Uh, we should have been activated by now to start handling the issue of these weapons all over the place that are infiltrated. Now, if you now add the issue of refugees that are likely to spill over, we pray that it doesn't happen, that there will be stability within that. Well, maybe with the military being, you know, being there, they will be there for 18 months, like they said, to plan for the next elections. Maybe that will help. You know, I pray that it does, so that we don't have their, their own instability. Obviously, we touch on our own security uh, challenges. So uh, we hope that. But of course, it's important for us to start putting some contingency plan in place as to how to handle possible spillover of refugees from Chad to us, increase the movement of small arms and light weapons. We, we have to put up some contingency plan for that immediately. You have the Senate um, intervention. I hate to interrupt your thoughts, but you yeah. have the Senate in intervention. Uh, there are about 500 million uh, small yeah. and light weapons, and, and of that figure, about 300 I, in million of them act act are yeah. in Nigeria alone yeah. in the hands, hands of non-state actors. Yeah. What did you make of that figure when you saw it, though? Yeah, well, you know, there are all kinds of estimates. It depends on which body, you know, gave that out. But, I mean, it's obvious. Unless somebody does a, a study, a, you know, a deliberate study. But, of course, there are bodies, world bodies, who monitor these things, and they can give those figures. Of course, with what we are experiencing, it's obvious that, of course, there are too many arms all over the place, and they're in the hands of the wrong people. Since, I mean, we've been in this situation for a while. Once a... The nation loses that monopoly of the use of force to non-state actors. It's a serious problem. Mm. And that's why we have to start doing something about that. Disarmament and, you know, all kind of programs that we can do to get these arms off the wrong hands. So would you say, I, I know that you are trying to give uh, solutions as to what we need to be doing. You're saying we should be monitoring the, you know, uh, flow of small and light weapons. We should have a contingency plan and we should activate it. Uh, but... I don't know if you still had more to add to that. Yes. I, I was also looking, you know, I mean, I, I guess we must have been doing that on the diplomatic front. Mm -hmm. How to help the current government, the interim government that will be in charge to really stabilize the nation. I'm sure the diplomatic uh, cycle will be thinking about that. That will be in our own enlightened self-interest. In our own enlightened self-interest, self yes. Because if we don't do that, if we wait for the, the effects to come, uh, it will be too late. So we need to do that up front, you know. And um, when you talked about disarmament, just quickly, a thought occurred to me as to what was happening in Zamfara, where when banditry bro broke out, the solutions uh, which we thought, because uh, if you also look, there have been disparity in terms of how to go about, you know, confronting these people. Uh, we saw that Zamfara adopted... Uh, you know, disarmament, so to speak, and compensation method, if you put... Cash off, for arm. Cash, exactly. Um, uh, solution. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, and do you think that, that is the way to go about disarmament? Yeah, it, it's, it's one way. There are many, many ways and means and methods of implementing disarmament. You, can, you, you, you use all kind of bits, carrot and stick and all of that to attract people to be willing to submit their weapons. But then there are certain conditions precedent that will encourage such people. So you have to create those conditions. You have to know the real root of the problem and you know, show them promise that you have taken care of that problem. Then they will be more willing to give up. Because a lot of people take up arms to, to increase their own confidence, not just for safety, for survivor in some cases. Okay, so if you don't give them the, the promise that you'll be responsible for their survival, for their, for their safety and security, 
Of course, they will not be willing. I mean, they, they, it's an inherent right of self-defense. And, you know, self-preservation is the first instinct of man. So they won't be. They won't, they, even when they pretend to bring, sometimes they bring the useless things and say they have submitted them. They are still keeping the very useful ones. <laughs> <laughs> general, you a general. You definitely know what is useless. <laughs> we'll take a break at this point and we'll come back, of course, to continue our conversation. Please stay with us. Well, retired Major General Henry Ayola is still with us in the studio and we're discussing matters pertaining to security. We'll not flip this to Lagos uh, for, my, for the questions of my colleagues. Gentlemen. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Major General, just staying on that uh, Chad situation for a bit, uh, there are a lot of countries that are a bit you know, hesitant. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me, General. There are some countries that are a bit hesitant on how to approach Chad in the light of you know, recent events. Some are saying, well, we'll wait to watch. Some even call it a coup. But for Nigeria, we're neighbors, and I mean, we, we don't have that luxury. So if you could just maybe give some advice to the government, how do we approach the relationship with Chad now? Uh, we, I know the Borno State governor has you know, said that we should have more cooperations across the region. But now that this has happened, how should the Nigerian government approach the relationship with Chad? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I had earlier mentioned this morning that, uh, that as part of a contingency plan of the country, we should be thinking of a diplomatic assistance kind of program with Chad uh, to help the interim government to stabilize the nation, uh, you know, preemptively so that uh, we don't have to suffer any spillover effect if... Uh, instability becomes the order of the day. So it should be part of it. It should be, uh, we, that also should bring to light the need to revisit our border security. Uh, we should put that in place also. Uh, whatever plan was there before, I think it's a time to activate uh, so that uh, we can act preemptively. You know, I've, you. Al I've always wondered, uh, General, I mean, you have a lot of these things uh, happening in Nigeria blamed on uh, what's happening in Libya, what has happened in Libya. And I, I keep wondering, I mean, you have Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt closely bordering Libya. Nigeria is like a country or two countries away from Libya, yet we feel that effect compared to Algeria, Egypt and the rest. Do they don't have to fight, uh, you know, insecurity, insurgency on this scale. And they are closely bordered uh, by Libya. So what are they maybe doing or what is different really? Yeah, you know, rebels, we naturally gravitate towards where they will be. They will have less resistance. It's a natural thing for them. Uh, I mean, number one, this uh, front for uh, change and concord of Chad, FCCC, they, they are majorly Libyans and majorly Chadians who went as missionaries to Libya. And now that the, the UN has uh, you know, signed an agreement for all foreign military you know, groups to leave Libya, that's why they have decided to come back home. Okay? Now, of course, in coming back home, if they get resistance in Chad, they will think of what alternative nearby countries to go to. And with, with the condi uh, conditions precedent right now, with, you know, prevalent within our own uh, territory, and the readiness of being able to either join forces with the whatever you know, faction of Boko Haram and some of the uh, infiltration that are taking place already you know, from across their own border to Nigeria, it will be certainly an attraction for them. And that's why we have to put some preemptive things in place now. Maybe we, apart from the diplomatic effort, the multinational joint task force also we need to perhaps we need to expand their role in that direction to help to be a blocking force uh, for such a movement from Chad towards Nigeria. Hmm. Well, thank you very talking much. About, talk, talking about talking uh, about those preemptive measures, General. I recall earlier when you were speaking, you said there were some things we left undone 
that maybe if we had done them, uh, we'll probably not be in such quagmire as we are right now. Um, if you don't mind, could you, you know, maybe give us some, um, some, some ex uh, specifics? Because in the course of speaking, you said that we needed to build a system of systems. The challenge in my head is systems are built by people and run by people. Now, we still have those systems. Who is going to build these systems? Who is going to run these systems in a way that we will not find ourselves where we are right now in another 20 years or 60 years from now? Because somehow we got here. We have to get out of this, out of where we are now, and then how do we ensure we don't get back there? Yeah, thank you very much, Ayo. I think you are bringing me to one point that uh, we have often uh, not spoken strongly about. I think it boils down to what I call the, the classical conspiracy of the elite, the elite class itself. And when I say the elite, I'm talking of the whole gamut of the elite, the political elite, the educated elite, the technocrats. I think we all need to come to a point where we agree that, look, so far we've been living in denial. So far. We've, been, we, we, we've not had the common good and the national interest in our hearts in, in, in making many of the policies, even the crafting of systems that we're talking about. Let's take, for example, in other climes, when, let's take just one example of uh, improvement of the take-home benefits of political office holders. Okay, I, I've seen in some country, if a president is going to increase the benefits of a president, he as the sitting president, who is doing it, will not be a beneficiary of it. Now, that's a smart way of crafting a, a, you know, a, a law not to make it something that will be based on self-interest. It means once the president knows that he is not going to benefit, so he will think again if he knows that he's not a beneficiary of what he's trying to put in place. But in our case, we make such laws and the sitting person who is making it is the first to benefit from it. So these are deliberate things. And you can't run systems that way. A system must be run to, to pluck loopholes. But more often than not, we exploit the loopholes in our system. You know, we, rather than plucking in, rather than studying, reviewing the existing and perfecting it so that the system can run better, we simply exploit those loopholes to our personal benefits. Do you want to give examples of, of situations where that has you know, backfired? Oh, very well, very well. I've just given the example of uh, uh, you know, benefits. Uh, le le let's look at the way we run some of our institutions, like my own sector, for example. Mm -hmm. I think we are still suffering from what I call the, you know, the KBAC mentality. Where we don't we don't want you know we don't want to be constrained. We want to do what we like, how we like, when we like, and if we like, you know. So you, you find if I'm in an office, uh, I don't want to offend so, so many people. No, please go <laughs> the ahead. examples in my head. Mm -hmm. Let, let's take for example a, a, a given office where you get there and you discover that the existing standard operating procedures of that office are not helping the system. But they, they help the man who is sitting on that seat because that gives him a field day. You know, he, he has ambient, I mean, an ample opportunity to maneuver and manipulate the system. And so nobody touches to fine tune how that office is run. Because everyone that comes say, oh, it gives me, I can operate like an emperor here with, with this, you know, leverage. Not, may, not sufficient rules to, you know, to, to put some limits of you know, exercise of power in place, okay? And so I, I, I stay there and I run my own tenure and the next person comes. And because it's to the benefit of whoever is sitting on that seat, he too will not touch it. But, but everybody else around them, you know, know that this is affecting us adversely. Yeah, but they're not in the position to, to change it. And they're not in the position to craft that, that particular system there. Is that in that, any that, way, that's what general? That's been happening in most of our, our things. That's why we are still where we are. But general, most of the time, it's not that the person sitting on that seat doesn't know that the system there can be improved. But it's enjoying a <laughs> near zero system that he met. But general, is that, isn't that in some way putting a question mark 
on our recruitment process generally, from the leadership to the followership to the engine that runs government, which is the civil service. Can you hear me, General? As I'm asking if that doesn't, what you just said now, if it doesn't put a question mark on our entire leadership recruitment process, from the leadership to the policy makers to the civil service, which are supposed to execute those policies and uh, laws that are created. Yes, of course it does. Uh, I mean, that's why I call it the, I, I say it's a complete elite class. That is, that is in conspiracy in this matter. Okay. Because we, we, do, we like to do what is convenient for us to do. You know, anything that will put more strain and task us beyond limit, we don't, we don't want to. Hmm. And if nobody is enforcing it, we just leave it. And okay. more often than not, I'm thinking of an example that is, uh, <laughs> that is not... That is that, touchy. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is not going to put anybody in trouble. Because I, I just look at... It, it, it's all over the place. It's all about it. At, at headquarters, for example, there are supposed to be standard operating procedures of what to do. Okay, let, let me give this example. When, when, uh, when I was in the war college, there was a colleague who was writing a paper. Okay, and the paper required that he had to go to a particular ministry and get their national policy. Okay, he got to that ministry and they couldn't even find a copy of the national policy. Ah. So, so then you then you ask yourself, how? The ministry that that national policy is meant for, they couldn't find a copy. They had to tell him that he should go and come back. So now that's an example. So you then ask yourself, so who wrote the policy and for who and who is using it? And then at the end of the maybe a five year, if it has a periodical review, we will sit and say we are reviewing something that we actually have not used. Whereas what it should be, like when I talk about system of systems, is that there should be a procedure when a policy is turned out, either it's an act or it's a policy, administrative policy or a legal document, there should be a procedure for reception, for dissemination, for assimilation, for review, and that review should be an annual review hmm. that should be part of the forecast of events of the different bureaucratic offices that are concerned, so that at the end of, if it's a five-year review, it should just be a collation of the annual reviews that have been Isn't done it? to review that document when it's due for review. Okay? Well, but general, that's not what we do in most of the cases. Well, General, one can say that that is perhaps yeah. a given, you know, in itself, but then there was an example you gave earlier, I'm wondering, how come we're not fighting the insurgency and all levels of insecurity we have when we fought the civil war? Now, the civil war had a military government in place, and now we have a civilian government in place. Are you sure it's a good comparison? Because, I mean, you know when the military wanted to do anything, it was just, it's a, it's a command structure. But here is a democracy. Can we really compare? Thank you very much. Well, the, the way crises are managed, the decision about war is still a political decision. It wouldn't matter that it's a military regime or a civilian regime. I mean, it was uh, one of the former president of uh, France, George Clemenceau, who said, and I quote, that war is too serious a business to be left to the generals. So it, End of quote. So it's not a function of either it's a military regime or a civilian regime. The, the, again, it boils down to processes and procedures. You know, the, the process of deciding to go to war, the process of deciding how to engage in national security challenge is purely a governmental thing. So it doesn't matter who is in government. If the process and procedures are there, then they should be applied. They should be activated. Okay, so, so the challenge again is what procedures and processes do we have in handling such challenges? Have we activated them? Have we updated them? You know, based on, I mean, the fluidity of security challenges you know, and the changes that are happening in the security environment since the Civil War to now. And that's the question we should be, we should be asking. And that's I, I the area we should be looking at. So, so it's not a matter of who is in power. It's a matter of a system that we're mm. on. 
Uh, and I'd like to focus on that for a bit. I mean, you said it, that war is too serious a business, according to that quote, to leave it to just generals. Um, by inference, it will mean that we're not really losing this battle on the field. I mean, the loss started way before our men probably responded uh, to calls or attacks by the insurgents. So if we were to start fixing this the right way, because I think a lot of attention has been focused on the men, the men on the field and the rest, who should be championing this systems of system change? Because clearly, if we don't sort it, then we'll keep recording the losses we see on the battlefield. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a good one. Uh, when it comes to crisis management, it goes beyond even the Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is also involved. There are all the security-related ministries, departments, and agencies. There should be a, an interministerial, interagency committee that will tackle these things with everyone bringing on board you know, their own core competencies to prefer solutions. And then, of course, before... Once the solution is preferred at the level of National Security Council, then the different agencies for implementation, we then take it off from there. That, that's, I mean, put in, just giving an abbreviation of how such a system should, should, should run. Okay? So, and let's take, for example, when I talk about the Civil War, there was a whole propaganda machine during the Civil War, which was championed and headed by the Ministry of Information. And thank God we still have the, one of the super PAMSEC alive, who was the PAMSEC of Minister of Information at that time. And they did a fantastic job to keep Nigeria together. Okay? Right now, I've not heard of anything like that. And so the, the, the enemy has a field day in their own propaganda, and we don't have a counter propaganda. We simply re react. We simply react. And more often than not, even when we are reacting, we are simply lying. You know, simply lying. You know, and it doesn't solve any problem. It doesn't help anything. So we should be able to beat the insurgents, even at the level of propaganda, information warfare, you know, psychological operations. You know, all of this should be deployed concurrently. Uh, I think this, interestingly, ties That's back like to... Right, pardon me. I think this ties back to the point you were making earlier about fighting this as a nation, coming together. Because if we don't do this as a nation, then clearly we might not win this. But... Over time, or let me just say in recent times, we've seen states uh, looking inwards and saying, well, I, we need to protect ourselves. And you've seen the security outfits that have come as a result of that. We just had a Bubago. In fact, I think a state in the South South also mentioned starting its own security outfit. So clearly, states are beginning to do this individually. Well, some say they, they come together. But do you think this helps that fighting it together as a nation? How much of an impact do you think this will have on fighting this insecurity as a nation? Yeah, sure. Uh, I welcome the idea of uh, regional security outfits. They, they should have their own place in the entire security architecture. Now, so the issue now is rejigging the security architecture itself, reviewing it, incorporating such efforts in the appropriate place within the cadre of that architecture and and you know, making sure it links with, within the system so that there is no disjoint. And then it will have an overall positive effect, no doubt. But if, they just, if these things arise on their own and they are not integrated into that security architecture and given the proper place to ensure that we can benefit from that effort, not, not uh, clandestinely stifling them, but rather giving them a good space where the fitting and their own effort can complement the government's effort. I think it's a good idea, a great idea. General, uh, uh, yesterday the Benue State Governor made some comments. Interestingly, uh, the, the Minister of Defense also made statements at, at, at the State House, some of which we have on the front page. But for the Benue State Governor, he believes that, uh, well, the the government has been complacent or complicit, if you will say. He said the actions or inactions of the government has largely uh, been responsible for what we have seen. He mentioned whether you call them killer herdsmen, bandits, kidnappers, or whatever. He believes that the federal government at that level is complacent to a large extent. So I'd like you to listen to it just to put it in context and get your response uh, to what the governor of Benue said. 
The action and inaction of government is clearly demonstrating that they have adopted what these people are doing. As far as I'm concerned, Boko Haram, Fulani Hillsmen, mm -hmm. Ishwa, ISIS, all of them are working towards the same goal in Nigeria. Let nobody deceive me. Mm -hmm. So that is it. And as long as Nigerians do not take this serious, they started as herdsmen. Then now they are called one a bandit. Mm. But why are they not being declared terrorists? Despite all our previous pleading and appeals and begging. Well, General, so that was part of what Governor Samuel Otum spoke about yesterday. What are your thoughts on that? Mm. Thank you very much. Well, uh, you know, the governor is speaking from his own perspective. Uh, the truth is that nobody has all the facts. Uh, we are all like uh, five blind men describing an elephant, uh, each one describing the portion of the elephant he touched. So it's not, uh, no one can fault another person's perspective because it is, it is the person who is wearing the shoes who knows where it, it pinches. Of course, as, as a professional, the way I would see it will obviously be different, but the, in the final analysis, what needs to be done should be done. I think that's the long and short of it. And like I keep saying, let's bring everyone that has something to offer on board and let it be a national effort that is not just uh, so, but seen to be so. Let, let there be you know, a rally. Let it even be a rallying point. I mean, it's known from history that when there is a general problem like that, it makes the people of a nation, either it's a community or a society, to ignore their differences in order to face a common enemy. If we use that, it will even be a way of galvanizing Nigerians towards unity, okay? And uh, so the issue of uh, sectionalism and all of that will surely be debunked by such national effort. You remember the slogan during the Civil War uh, that was created by General Gohan then, that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to keep Nigeria one is a task that must be done, you know? Uh, and that's, that became a rallying point. And so it elicited the cooperation of everyone to know that, look, this is a national issue. We must address it together, collectively. So that's my advice on that. Thank you very much. Well, General, I don't know if you ever saw this in terms of how, um, I, in terms of, the disparity, as I mean, you just said that the, the point of the Benue State governor was making is his own, I mean, from his own perspective. However, you know, the, because of perspectives like that, it is becoming more and more difficult for us to have a consensus on how to approach this myriad of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, from your own perspective, because it's your own perspective that you provide, how do you think that is hampering the fight? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's obvious to everyone that we've not given this challenge our best shot yet. It's obvious. Of course, if we have, then, I mean, Boko Haram from 2009 to now, we should have uh, at least diminished their power to still hold ground or to still be able to fight. Let, 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 let me touch on that a little. Because when you look at it, I'm going to quote one of my friends, is my namesake, Baron Antoine Henri de Jomini, in his Art of War. He wrote that the, for any nation, any nation, any government to put its military, to, to disregard its military under any pretext whatsoever, is to prepare that military for disgrace and the nation for humility. Okay? When, I mean, like I said, the things that ought to have been done that have not been done. Because equipping your armed forces is not an overnight business. It's not a one-time thing. You, you plan a program to say, look, what kind of wars are we going to fight in the next 15 years? 
What are the challenges? You do your threat analysis, you do your risk assessment, you do your environmental security assessment. You put all of those things together and say, look, who are likely to be our enemies in the next 15, 20 years? That way. And then so what kind of armament, weapons, and equipment do we need to fight the kind of battles or wars that will be fought in those years? Then you begin to equip your armed forces accordingly over a period of time. Five, ten years. That's how it's done. So if we didn't do that, if we had done that, I, 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 I was privileged as a field commander at the time to see some of the fantastic reports that the, the SSS write about security situation in the country. And of course, they, 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 do, they are fantastic, very professional guys there. And they do those work. But of course, the final decision of what to do with them is the political masters. Okay, so... If only all along, even things like, uh, like Boko Haram, all the time when they were just like a sect, preaching some you know, inflammable things, there were reports on them. Nobody took those reports seriously until they broke, broke out, until when Muhammad Yusuf was killed and then they became violent and all of that. So these things, that's, that, that's how they happen. So failure to do certain things in the past is what give you know, room to, I mean, the thing coming back to hunters. Okay, so if we now have to address those things, of course, it's now a state of emergency. Again, one of the things I said about the way the civil war was addressed, do you know that there were only five battalions of the entire army before the civil war started? Five battalions. At the end of the civil war, we had four divisions, which means there was emergency recruitment, emergency commission, to meet the requirement of that war. So why are we not doing that now? Are we saying this one is not as serious as the Civil War? And yet it has lingered this, no, this long? Mm. General, big questions. I mean, when you, when you say that, uh, you know, we need, we ought to have been planning at least 15 years ahead, one will say now that we're currently embroiled in the crisis that we're embroiled in, you know, how are we going to plan for what will happen 15 years on? Big questions. But we have to thank you for always taking time out to speak to us uh, anytime you're called upon. And uh, we hope that you won't get tired of speaking. <laughs> it's a job that we have. Uh, thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Today this morning. We had Major General Henry Ayola as a former commander of Special Task Force Operation Safe Haven.